Welcome and thanks for staying with us. Now, in the week, the Open Society Foundations launched a $15 million initiative to strengthen and expedite efforts surrounding the restitution of artifacts and cultural objects looted from the African continent. The launch coincides with the first anniversary of the publication of the Sar Savoy report, which called for the immediate unconditional return of African objects gained through theft, looting, despoilment, trickery and forced consent prior to 1960. Now, the president of the Open Society Foundations and former U.S. ambassador to South Africa, Patrick Gaspard, joins us now via Skype from Europe. A very good morning to you, Ambassador Gaspard. Thank you so much uh, for joining us uh, today. Thank you so very much for having me on, Desiree, and it's uh, wonderful to be on my favorite TV network once more. <laughs> The, now, the conversation about the ownership of colonially looted art, human remains, etc., that has been reignited by the Sar Savoy report is a centuries-old conversation. Um, why has the Open Society's foundations uh, decided to back it? Well, this is a terribly important issue that, as you say, uh, Desiree has been discussed for some time, most pronouncedly since... Uh, around the mid-1970s when Africans themselves spoke up in multilateral bodies like the United Nations demanding the restitution of artifacts and priceless objects to the African continent that were looted during the colonial period. Uh, but the moment has been galvanized by a report that was issued one year ago this week uh, under the co it was commissioned by the French President Emmanuel Macron uh, and the academics uh, Benedict Savoy and Felwyn Saar uh, in their groundbreaking report, said that these artifacts should be returned from Europe to Africa immediately with no excuses. Uh, and they noted that even where I am now, I'm, I'm in London right now, Desiree, uh, in uh, London alone in the British Museums, there are 75,000 artifacts from the African continent that are on display. Uh, and, and oftentimes they're on display uh, in ways that distort the ways that they were looted uh, from uh, Africa itself. Uh, so one year later, we are making a statement and we're saying that the restitution of these materials is not about just redressing the horrors of the past, but allowing this generation of Africans to reclaim their cultural heritage, their history uh, and their identity uh, into the future. It's a massive project. What will be uh, the role of uh, 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 Open Society's foundations? Well, we're pleased that the 15 million uh, U.S. dollars that we will invest over the course of the next four years will help to create networks on the African continent of African scholars, uh, artists, uh, activists, and spiritual leaders uh, who will work to make the claims of repatriation and to lift up infrastructure on the continent uh, to receive the materials, to display the materials, and to really provide public education uh, on what happened uh, in the not too distant past uh, and to better integrate and incorporate uh, these materials in ways that will animate development uh, for Africa today. Uh, as Steve uh, Biko uh, often said, the most potent tool of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. Uh, and being able to reclaim one's history uh, and one's uh, spiritual uh, identity is absolutely critical. A few years ago uh, in South Africa, uh, we had the return of the remains of Sarah Bartman uh, from uh, England uh, to South Africa. And we saw at the time that, that made a real difference uh, for uh, the community. Uh, in South Africa, you have a new la act in your legislature calling for the repatriation uh, of uh, artifacts and uh, historic uh, remains. And it's imp it was important uh, in, 1970, in 1970s, in the 80s, uh, and it will be important for the next half uh, of uh, this century. That infrastructure matters. Uh, this moment in history uh, is galvanizing. And what will be the role of African countries and governments in this effort that seeks, seeks to bring them into the fullness of their being? It is important to note, uh, Desiree, that this is advocacy that's always been taken up uh, by African leaders uh, themselves. Uh, I've been impressed with the energy that we've seen from African cultural institutional uh, leaders who are saying that they have right now today uh, the capacity to repatriate uh, uh, all of these uh, materials, and most importantly, uh, African scholars who uh, have spent generations really researching, uh, identifying the looted remains, and who are prepared to socialize in their communities 
uh, the importance uh, of uh, these, these, these objects aesthetically, uh, historically, uh, and uh, spiritually. I also want to note, uh, Desiree, and this is something that South Africans know well, the creation of cultural uh, institutions is terribly important for economic development and ec economic opportunity as well, uh, and it can lead to a more broadly shared prosperity and transformation. These things are uh, completely linked with one another. So 75% of the resources that we're investing in uh, this effort will go uh, to the continent, most especially in the first instance to West Africa, where Nigeria, uh, Benin, uh, and Senegal in particular have long been calling for the repatriation of materials like uh, the legendary Benin bronzes, which were uh, uh, just criminally uh, stolen from Africa. Ambassador, you've already touched on uh, a number of the artifacts that are in different countries outside of Africa, but just give us a sense of the scale in terms of uh, uh, Africa's legacy that is kept or exhibited unlawfully in countries that are not their countries of origin. As I, as I noted, Desiree, just where I am right now uh, in uh, Great Britain, there are 75,000 objects in uh, uh, British museums, and on the African continent, you only have about... Uh, 3,000 uh, historic objects that are on display. So this one country uh, alone has more than the entire continent has on display. And let me be clear about something. Uh, in most of the European museums, uh, the most important uh, African artifacts are not even in places where the African diaspora can have access to them. They're sitting uh, in warehouses, they're held uh, in places where only uh, scholars and academic researchers are private collectors uh, have access to them. When this report was issued a year ago, the Benedict Savoy uh, report, uh, it said that apologies are no longer sufficient, are no longer uh, appropriate in and of themselves, and there needs to be immediate repatriation. Uh, in Germany, uh, an act was passed that uh, created an investment pool uh, that would help to create the capacitation uh, and the scholarship around uh, repatriation. We're seeing that uh, in England uh, as well. We're seeing it uh, in uh, France and we're seeing it throughout uh, all of Europe. Uh, and our hope and expectation is that young African scholars will take the baton from their predecessors who have long been making this call uh, and will uh, create uh, vital new institutions mm -hmm. uh, and most importantly, vital access uh, for the next generation of uh, Africans who will re restate their claim, uh, not just in the past, uh, but in their future. This report that you're, this French report you're talking about, France itself is considered one of the foremost transgressors. How, how is this country taking responsibility mm -hmm. and which artifacts is it returning? It's, it's taking responsibility far too slowly, Desiree. Uh, it's been two years now since President Macron uh, made uh, a set of remarks in Burkina Faso uh, that really gave some momentum to the cause of restitution. It was the first time that we had a European head of state say in no uncertain terms that this had to occur. That led to the commissioning uh, and empaneling of uh, Savoy uh, and uh, Felwyn Saw uh, and uh, their groundbreaking report. But their report was issued a year ago. Since then, uh, there have been uh, incremental uh, steps towards uh, restoration. A few days ago, last Sunday, uh, the French government returned uh, to Senegal, a, an important uh, saber from a historic figure who fought against uh, colonialism in Senegal. Uh, that was symbolic, uh, but not nearly enough. We've seen symbolic steps taken by the Germans uh, in places like Namibia. Again, uh, incremental, not nearly enough. We are talking about tens of thousands of objects. Uh, and we're also talking about human remains, uh, bones that were uh, taken uh, from uh, throughout the African uh, continent uh, that belong interned uh, on the continent uh, in African soil, uh, in uh, African communities. There's tremendous beauty uh, that has been uh, repossessed uh, from Africa, uh, powerful spirituality, uh, and a sense of historic identity. When Ian Smith uh, tried to defend the, the worst offenses uh, in uh, Rhodesia, uh, he said at the time that Africans were not responsible for any meaningful scholarship, scientific developments, artistic uh, developments. We all know that's not true, but there was an intentional erasure that Europeans undertook uh, that has implications right now uh, th uh, through uh, today and uneven development. 
we're trying to restore some of that balance. So this week in South Africa, uh, uh, Marcus Gavi's son, Dr. Julius Gavi, is here as part of an initiative to remember mm. the effects of slavery. It's a project together with Ghana in an effort. To, this effort also includes the possible repatriation of human remains. How do you hope uh, to deal with the issue of returning human remains in this project? First, I'll just note that it's terribly important that Dr. Garvey is there uh, sharing uh, his scholarship. I'm always excited when all of us uh, from uh, the African diaspora are able to make a uh, common cause. Uh, the return of human uh, remains uh, is critically important and something that should be understood, uh, not just uh, in Africa, uh, but in Europe as well, uh, as uh, uh, not only critical, but uh, it speaks powerfully to a dehumanizing moment uh, in the relationship between Europe uh, and Africa. We've already seen the restoration of some remains uh, in Ethiopia. Uh, I noted uh, what uh, took place uh, recently uh, in uh, South Africa, uh, but there is, there's a need for this to be uh, accelerated. Uh, the uh, uh, human remains um, should be uh, un uh, just uncorruptible, uh, and um, uh, it's, uh, uh, it speaks to a kind of uh, brutality uh, that uh, should not be permitted to uh, be persistent in the 21st century. Uh, so we're excited uh, that in addition to uh, objects of art uh, and spirituality, uh, that these remains are part of the repatriation and the restitution effort as well, Desiree. So in a project as big as this one, there are issues, or as old as this one, there are issues of litigation that sometimes hold up the progress. Take us through mm. some of the litigation challenges that you have faced or you yeah, imagine you know, envisage you'll be facing. We, 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 are, uh, we are anticipating that, Desiree, and, and, and through uh, this $15 million effort, in addition to working with scholars, we'll be working with strategic litigators uh, from uh, throughout uh, Africa who have already uh, spent a generation uh, of research uh, in uh, universities and in the courts on this issue. But let's remember what this is about. Who has the right, Desiree, to own particular histories? It's astounding to be sitting here uh, in London where uh, the British law says that repatriation uh, is not even a remote uh, possibility uh, without orders uh, in uh, Parliament. Uh, so there's going to be a need to take up advocacy, not just on the African continent, uh, but here in London, uh, certainly in Paris, uh, in uh, Berlin uh, as well, uh, in order to uh, be able to uh, overcome uh, these barriers to, to historic uh, restitution. We know that the law uh, is a powerful uh, instrument that has long worked uh, against um, uh, Africa uh, in, European, uh, in European courts, uh, but we uh, intend uh, that African barristers are going to have the resources that they need uh, working with governments in multilateral spaces uh, to overcome this challenge. Ambassador, just on another matter, um, uh, most of our viewers, not most actually, some uh, might not be aware of the work of the Open Societies Foundations. Just uh, give us a, a break, break their work down for us, please. And also, uh, recent reports have alluded that the founder, Mr. George Soros, is not in good health. Is he good? Oh, uh, not only is Mr. Soros in good health, uh, he's more vibrant than ever. Uh, and I cannot keep up with, it, with his energies. Uh, Desiree, thank you for the question. The Open Society Foundations has been active uh, on the continent for over three decades now. Uh, the site of uh, Mr. Soros' first philanthropy outside of his native Hungary uh, was in South Africa, where in 1979 he came uh, at the invitation of black South African scholars uh, who were looking to overcome the scourge of apartheid, uh, and he first lifted up a set of scholarships uh, that benefited young scholars then and continues to accrue to the benefit of South Africa today. We have foundations in West Africa and Eastern Africa and uh, in Southern Africa uh, working at the cross-section of justice, uh, equal access to rights uh, and equal access to health care uh, and uh, to education as well. Uh, we're proud of the historic work role that we've played. Uh, and last year I was thrilled uh, to join our South African brothers and sisters to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the founding of our foundation in South Africa. There are 250,000 units of housing in South Africa that come 
uh, from the work of Mr. Soros and from the Open Society Foundation. Uh, that's a legacy that's the former ambassador to South Africa. Uh, I will always uh, claim and be uh, rightly proud of. Uh, but uh, we're looking forward uh, to the work of economic inclusion and econ economic justice uh, that will be the central point uh, of our efforts uh, into the future. Uh, and you know, Desiree, how that matters most uh, in a country like South Africa that is still working to overcome the spatial architecture of apartheid. Now, just looking a bit back into your history, uh, can you believe it's only been ab about two weeks since the U.S. Embassy here in South Africa appointed a replacement <laughs> for you since you left? Just uh, your thoughts about Ms. Lana Marx? Well, you know, I, I will say that uh, it's uh, shameful that not only in South Africa, but throughout the globe, uh, the U.S. has been uh, incredibly slow. Uh, in replacing uh, ambassadors that have uh, left the, uh, their countries. Now, you have a fantastic U.S. Embassy staff uh, in South Africa, in Joburg, in uh, Cape Town, in Pretoria, uh, and in Durban. Uh, but there's, uh, you know, I'll be humble uh, in saying there's nothing like having an ambassador uh, in place. Uh, I was able to congratulate uh, Ambassador uh, Lana Marks uh, when she uh, arrived uh, in uh, South Africa. Uh, I think that her uh, history as an entrepreneur, uh, her familiarity with uh, the culture, her ability to speak uh, several South African languages uh, should benefit uh, U.S.-South African relationships. Uh, I will uh, note, though, uh, that when you are the ambassador uh, in a country representing your country, uh, you have to carry the defense of policies uh, by your president uh, as well. Uh, when I was in South Africa, uh, I was able to um, uh, have an association with uh, positive investments being made by the Obama administration in uh, the African continent. But I also uh, had to answer some important questions uh, in South Africa about policies that South Africans disagreed with. Uh, I think that Ambassador Marks uh, will find uh, that this is a moment where Africans are asking some really important questions about uh, the U.S.-South Africa relationship, the U.S.-Africa uh, relationship at a time when U.S. has receded in its international uh, leadership. Uh, and frankly, uh, the current uh, occupant of the White House has said a number of unfortunate things about Africa and specifically about South Africa uh, that I believe is unbecoming to the office of uh, the president uh, and unbecoming of our historic relationship. Uh, I'm certain uh, that Ambassador Marx uh, will uh, represent uh, the broad interest of all of the American people uh, who embrace uh, the partnership uh, with South Africa uh, and know that it will work to the benefit of all of us on both sides of the Atlantic. There's a lot of curiosity about what uh, President, former President Obama is doing these days uh, and uh, what your relationship is with him going forward. You are a very important uh, part of his team. I, I was uh, blessed, uh, Desiree, to have played uh, a modest role uh, in the election of the president, uh, and then I got to serve in the White House and, of course, uh, in uh, South Africa. Uh, the president's doing really well. Uh, president Obama uh, is uh, active. He's uh, completing uh, his book, which uh, we'll hopefully all have uh, soon. And uh, he's launched a global uh, foundation that's working uh, with young leaders uh, in uh, Africa, uh, in Asia, in Latin America, and, of course, in uh, the U.S., uh, to uh, create tr create transformational vehicles uh, for future growth and, and for partnership. Uh, it was incredible to be with President Obama a little more than a year ago uh, in South Africa when he delivered the Mandela Lecture uh, to a cheering uh, stadium. Uh, but in that address that day, uh, the president uh, was incredibly uh, sober and uh, pragmatic about the state uh, of the world uh, and was clear uh, that uh, his generation, uh, our generation, uh, did not uh, fulfill all of the potential and all of the promises uh, and that we're going to have to invest in this next generation uh, if we're going to touch the North Star of true, meaningful progress. I'm excited by what he's, what, uh, he's doing now. Uh, I'm proud of the association we've had in the past, uh, but even more uh, excited about all that we're going to do uh, to partner in South Africa and throughout uh, the region. I was only told you're in Europe, so I'm glad to hear you're in London. There are no big issues about time differences or you having to wake up to take this interview. <laughs> Thank you so Des much for talking Des to Des us Ray, this morning. I would wake up at any time. I'd wake up at any time. Oh, to be Ambassador Gaspard. It's, it's a great honor.
true on other side as well. Thank you so much. Former ambassador to South Africa, former U.S. ambassador to South Africa, and now the president of the Open Society Foundations, Patrick Gusford. Let's take a break.